Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's Rural Outreach and Innovation Talk, uh, which is brought to you as part of the European Microfinance Platform, um, which is where we, we like to showcase the latest trends in rural developments by sharing ideas and experiences and different inspirational stories. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to be joined by Indomiso Mfofu, who is a director at Vision Fund. Um, he's going to be describing market solutions, which were used to increase the speed of recovery uh, for communities that were affected by El Nino. And he's also going to present a summary of the findings from recovery lending in fragile African states from November 2015 uh, through June 2017. As a little bit of background, um, he was an agricultural economist and microfinance specialist with an and extensive experience in the use of financial products and services, uh, which are aimed at enhancing economics of rural agricultural farmers across all of Africa. Um, his work focuses on the application of specialized techniques that are used to adapt lending methodology uh, that allows clients to affected by disasters to rebuild their businesses and repay their loans without being um, overcome by uh, debt, debt that they accumulated. So, uh, Ndomisu, thank you very, very much for being here today with us. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, please go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, as already said, I'm Ndomisu Mbofu. I'm the Director for Agricultural Finance in Vision Fund, responsible for the Africa region. And I'm just going to run through our experience that we had when we implemented a recovery lending program in three countries in Africa that were affected by El Nino. And just on the slide that you see there, you see a man driving a single pool there and a woman following with a heavy load on her back. That's the general status of uh, farming practice in most of our African countries where the cow belongs to the men and the woman just provides labor and all the hard work and is always following behind. We want to transform this farmer to be a, have a commercial mindset and be able to drive many cows and also have the woman much closer to the cows and much, having much more control on the assets that they generate in, 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 in their households. So I mean, just as a way of introducing what we do, and we use microfinance and insurance tools to try and get farmers uh, to transform their agricultural production. Let me just start by highlighting the risks that the farmer faces on a day-to-day -day basis. On the chart that you see, the x-axis is on the uh, frequency, uh, on the level of impact, and the y-axis is the uh, frequency of the uh, event. So if you look on my left going up, we have many events that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, and they happen frequently, and these are things that people worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. And these events happen like a death in the family, sickness in the family, and in terms of impact on the family or on the households, the impact is very small. As you see going to my right, the impact will be increasing. So in these events, we find that a farmer is worried that my son will get sick, I'll need to send my children to school. But the frequency of this event is high, but the impact is very low. As we move further to my right, we actually see that there are larger events that people will worry about. These are events like maybe you, your cow dies out of a disease, or maybe you have uh, pests attacking your crops and it wipes them away. Again, the farmer gets worried about these, and also they get worried about whether they'll be able to get sufficient inputs to get into the next farming season. The frequency of these worries are less, but the impact is much greater. Then we have effects of natural disasters, such as uh, droughts, floods, earthquakes, and other things. These things don't happen very often, so you can see the graph is coming down in terms of frequency. But in terms of impact, it can be disastrous, as they are called disasters. It can actually take a farmer completely out of business. Imagine if all your crop is wiped away by a flood or a drought, makes you have nothing, and then you have no inputs even for the next season. So just as a way of uh, 
saying the farmers are facing these risks and climate change has increased the impact and the frequency of these risks. And what happens in a post-disaster context? There is a market failure that happens. Supply of credit generally shrinks as uh, uh, microfinance institutions realize that the risk is higher or perceive that the risk is higher and they withdraw their funding. While on the other hand, because farmers and businesses have lost their assets and businesses, they need more credit, so increasing demand for credit. And on the other hand, the MFI, because of increased non-performing loans, realizes a problem with liquidity and non-performing land loans may increase. And when we go to donors and relief programs, they are also looking at um, funding day-to-day uh, -day hunger and the blankets, and they are not worried about supporting MFI lending operations. So these are the things that happen post-disaster. The supply of credit shrinks and the demand of credit increases. And we have said through the solutions that we offer, we can offer recovery lending to help microfinance institutions increase the supply of credit that would have actually been responding to the uh, increase in demand. And when uh, MFIs face liquidity challenges, we can put in place uh, insurance-like schemes that will actually protect and provide liquidity to MFIs when they are in a disaster situation so that they can continue providing finance to those rural communities. And also we see donors uh, needing to see a complementary, uh, providing complementary humanitarian and disaster response, which emphasizes on restoration of livelihoods. But this is just dealing with uh, slower onset and onset crises. But we actually need uh, things that will actually shift actors in the market and help women and children as well as uh, men to actually respond and be able to restore their livelihoods uh, and just demand or, uh, depend on handouts from donors. Let me just get back to how we responded to the El Nino uh, phenomenon when it uh, came about in uh, 2015, 2016 farming seasons. In about August, we began to see uh, signs and the news that uh, Southern Africa and East Africa will actually face major disaster due to El Nino. And there are some of the sources of the information that we got. And we, the further in September, that information was strengthened by information from Global uh, Parametrics, our partner, and also from the Kenya Weather Services, which actually confirmed that, yes, a drought is coming and floods are coming. Then we started sensitizing our MFIs that we are likely to face this program. We also started mobilizing resources, <clears throat> and we also started adapting programs and policies so that the products will be more suitable for uh, the post-disaster context. And we also said, well, we need to know what is happening. We created reporting tools for recovery lending, and we went branch by branch to assess the needs, and then we also forecasted the required finance per branch and per MFI. And we said, well, while we are doing this, we also want to learn, and we contracted Tango to do a baseline and move with us as we implement recovery lending and monitor our impact. We were equally surprised. We, the demand that we estimated was far outstripped by the supply of credit that we had. We had to revise our targets uh, three times in the process as uh, the number of loans was far exceeding the targeted number of loans. So over time, our close monitoring enabled us to track and report and, report and respond to this increased challenge. By the end of the period, uh, February 2016 to June 2017, we had disbursed 3.3 million loans, and uh, um, these loans were used to establish old businesses as well as to establish new businesses. You'll recall that in Southern Africa, some countries 
have only one farming season and it will take at least eight months for them to go into the next farming season. So some farmers ventured into horticulture to bridge the gap between the failed crop season and the next season. And in total, we reached uh, 14,500 families. And our estimate is that the, we reached 87,000 beneficiaries, which is children, women, and other family members, and assuming a, a multiplier factor of three beneficiaries per, per family. We thought it would be a challenge to collect repayments given that uh, these people are in disaster. But that graph goes on to show that we had an initial period when the loans disbursements, which are in, in, in gray, that's the portfolio value, and the number of loans, which is in blue, they went up. And then they steadily came down as repayments started flowing until May yet when we closed the project with very small loans that were remaining for the MFIs to MF up. So you can actually see that we had a steep increase in lending and a very steady decline in loan balances as clients were paying. So it's actually clear that good clients will remain clients, good clients even in times of disasters. And flexible and adaptive repayment methods enhances trust and allows you to collect money even in disaster situations. Kenya in particular and Zambia faced a serious challenge of secondary shocks. Kenya was initially affected by floods, and then this was followed by droughts. Zambia, we had a drought, and when it went into the season, it was followed up by pests and diseases. And all these aftershocks affected clients. But despite this, the trust that we had developed and the rescheduling of the loans that we adapted allowed clients to have trust and continue to make repayments. So I think we want to emphasize that good clients will remain good clients even in times of disaster. What they just need is a close monitoring and understanding of what their situation is. Again, that's a graph showing the quality of our portfolio. It remains still fairly green. The green portion is the clean portfolio, and the yellow is the one to 30 days, and the red is what was over 30 days. But I must say that those were small portions compared to uh, what we uh, had in the green portion. And at the close of the project, we had almost 97% payment rate, which is higher than some of the lending that is done under normal circumstances. And we may talk about what we did and what uh, we collected and what we and all the other things. But let me just take you through what some of our clients experienced during the disaster and how our loans impacted on their lives. The lady you see in the picture there is our client called Alice Mkumbazala of Malawi. She's a mother of two. She traditionally does dryland maize farming and produces about four tons per year. And one ton is used for household consumption and three tons she sells to generate money for the family. During the 2015-2016 season, she only harvested two bags of maize, which is 100 kgs. And this is just sufficient to feed her family for two months. Then what happens to the rest of the year? First, with this disaster, she came to Vision Fund and obtained a mere loan of $70 to buy inputs to venture into horticulture. There are some perennial streams around there where they can actually get water throughout the year, and she actually got inputs to put up a horticulture garden. And by October, she had actually cleared her loan repayment in full, and she says that she actually saves more money to buy inputs for the coming season. And the husband says, if it was for loan and these vegetables, we would have sold our goods and I would have been forced to separate from the family to go and look for employment. So this is a huge social impact in terms of having been able to keep the family together and keep the children in school. Another client uh, in uh, southern Zambia, again, uh, called uh, Beni Nsanyang Sanganyaya. She, is, uh, she lost her maize crop due to the drought and was forced to withdraw children from school and she reduced the meals from three to one or sometimes two. She got 
1,000 for a poultry business, as you can see the poultry business on the, on the left. And with that, she was able to generate quickly, money quickly, as a poultry business has a quicker turnaround period than the normal uh, maize production or other agricultural activities. And she was able to send back her children to school and return back to normal life. And again, she also says she made savings to buy inputs for the following seasons. And she says now the business has been a major source of income for the family and has transformed our livelihood. In fact, speaking to Benny, she has not stopped her poultry business. Despite that, she is now into a new farming season. She continued with her poultry business as she has seen it as a way of building her resilience. And going forward, we have set up what we call a Bima Maono product. And the Bima Maono means insurance vision. And where we see insurance as a core part of developing integrated agricultural finance. Within the Bima Maono, we have a strong group multi insurance which covers farmers against the events such as uh, pests and diseases and uh, uh, insufficient moisture content in the fields. And also for livestock, we can have improvement as well as the diseases. We also have a lending with the artists where we are setting up a, a body to provide funding and capacity building for MFIs so that they can continue lending through disaster situations. And the MFIs will be paying a small premium towards this so that it becomes a sustainable fund. And in all this, we feel that it is important for working in partnership with other players. While we provide credit and insurance, we need to work with credible insurance providers as partners. We also need to work with uh, agriculture extension trainers and providers so that the um, other risks other than uh, natural disasters are eliminated from the production process. Back to the slide I started with, you can actually see that we have tailored a set of solutions to cover all the risks that the farmer faces on a day-to-day -day basis. For the low impact but high frequency risks, just like uh, death in the family, children going to school, we can provide savings in the box there on the first box savings as well as small loans to help the farmer cushion themselves against that shock. And when we get larger events like disease and pests, we have uh, crop and livestock insurance, and against death, we have enhanced credit life uh, insurance policies. We also have insurance on economic assets such as cows, uh, or maybe if you have a tractor and other things, we have uh, asset insurance. And at a higher level, when we have natural disasters, we have set up what we call Financial Disaster Risk Management Program, which operates our African uh, Disaster Resilience in in Insurance Fund, ATIS, so that when there is a drought, we can be able to support our MFIs to rebuild their lending and also support our clients to uh, continue with their business. I think I will end it there and say, take any questions if there are any, and just say we are there to uh, serve the MFI so that they can be able to serve the clients much better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dumiso, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I just had a, a couple quick questions because I think we have a little bit of time here. Um, yeah. I guess, you know, coming from a background working with a consulting agency and reading lots of, you know, different things that are done in different places around the world, are there any um, government solutions or programs that are working, like, together with what you're doing? I don't know if that question makes a ton of sense, but... Like not, I not immediately, but in uh, Kenya and Uganda, we are looking at working with the government agency in terms of the government is providing subsidies on agricultural insurance. So we want to tap onto that where the clients will pay 50% of the insurance premium. So that is for crop and livestock insurance. And mm -hmm. then at another level, the program on insurance works 
closely with agronomic support and we rely a lot on uh, government agricultural extension officers to provide that support as well as to provide risk monitoring. So in Tanzania, for instance, it is the government extension workers that actually do uh, um, inspection visit on behalf of the insurer to see that the crops have germinated, to see that if there are any incidents like pests, they actually are the ones who are going to inspect and give a report that, yes, there was an army worm outbreak and it uh, damaged to this level. Mm -hmm. And then after, at, just before harvest, they go and do what we call crop cuts, where they will actually estimate the yield from the field before the farmer starts harvesting. So they'll sample a number of farms, and out of those, we can do crop cuts using government agencies. They are a more credible uh, independent assessor than when the insurance or ourselves go and do the crop assessment on our own. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, is there, um, like, I, it was the one slide you showed with, uh, I believe it was a woman who um, ended up starting a poultry business. Um, yeah. Um, is there any sort of, uh, like, technical assistance, uh, like teaching um, that comes with the loans or that is available to them, that is recommended to them for when they start a, I guess, a supplemental business like that? There are programs where we work with other partners who would actually provide the technical assistance. And uh, in some cases, it's a practice that the farmer is already familiar with. I'll give an example of um, a partnership we run in Zambia with Kickstart. Kickstart provides turtle pumps to farmers. Mm -hmm. And during a drought like this, then farmers can actually go into vegetable and horticulture farming using kickstart uh, uh, treadle pumps. And those pumps come with training. So kickstart will come and run, a, a, they call it agripreneur training for the farmer so that the farmer learns how to make money from micro irrigation and how to do the cash flows and how to access markets. So yes, we do get support to entrepreneurs to venture into for those kind of businesses but it's not us who provide the training but the partners that we work with with yeah. respect to poultry farmers it is the companies that supply stock feeds and and and, and they all chicks that provide the support mm -hmm. do you find that that um that happens has happened a fair amount when someone starts a, a secondary business because something has happened like you know the natural disaster do they tend to to keep going with that second business as well and, and trying to grow that way or do they usually just go back to what they know what they've known better in the past that's exactly what this lady told us to say i have started this poultry business i'm still continuing with my maize farming but i'm not stopping the poultry business because it has actually built my resilience and many of them actually are doing that. They are continuing with whatever they are doing and still maintain that uh, extra business as a way of building resilience. Interesting. Well, that's, I mean, that's fascinating. Good work. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, that's uh, all the time that we have for today. Um, so I want to thank, you know, everyone for for viewing and, and joining us here today and, and participating. And a special big thank you uh, to um, Indomiso for a wonderful presentation and, and answering my questions uh, so, so diligently. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Rural Outreach and Innovation Talks are scheduled to continue on October 19th. And that's when uh, Marina Corton-Bush is going to speak to all of us about her experience in building green communities. Um, so I look forward to seeing you know, many of you there. Hopefully you all can join us. Uh, thank you again for your time um, and enjoy the rest of your day.